Good morning. How's everybody doing? Man, good to see you. It's Jersey Sunday. So naturally, I'm repping the greatest team in the NBA. You know, we haven't been in the playoffs in over 12 years. We've never won a championship, but uh, this year might be our year, guys. What do you think? We need to intercede for the Kings, y'all, okay? Like, God is moving in their, in their team right now, and uh, I'm believing for playoffs. Somebody say playoffs. Hey, I'm excited. Uh, my name is Caleb. I'm one of the pastors here at Project Church, and I'm closing out this series today that we've called Energy. Uh, man, it's going to be five. This is our fifth week, and it's been a, a, an amazing time we've had together hitting on these big areas of our life. And I've actually got tons of feedback from this, from this series. So if you missed any of it, I'd encourage you to go back. You can watch online. We have a YouTube channel. It's on our website, as well as we have an iTunes podcast. And we're actually on Spotify now, too, um, podcast. So you can jump on Spotify. You can listen to our sermons on there. So we're everywhere, y'all. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to catch up. And uh, you can see the, behind me on the screen the series and what this has looked like. We hit vision, relationship goals, mental, physical health, work. But today we're talking about finances. But before we jump in there, I want to set us up for next week. So next week we're starting an all new series and we're calling it Marked, Marked by Jesus. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through the book of Mark verse by verse. Um, We're doing something, we have never done this at Project Church. We're going to walk through the entire book of Mark verse by verse. And it is going to take us the next two years to get through it. And so we're going in, man. We're going all in on this. We're still going to take some breaks in the series. We're going to have our At The Movie series right after Easter. We're still doing a relationship series in the spring. But intermixed, we're going to constantly come back to the book of Mark, where over the next two years, we'll journey through verse by verse this entire book. We're going to dig in. And it's going to be an amazing time together. Next week, we'll have journals for all of you. Uh, So I'd encourage you to come back. And uh, jump in with us on this journey as we really dig into the Word of God together. I can't wait. I think God's going to do some amazing things through it. Also, if you haven't signed up for a community group yet, they're launching next week. Um, You can sign up today in the lobby. You'll see uh, there's some sheets in the lobby as well as signs for all the different groups. And uh, it'll give you everything you need to know. Or you can do it on your phones right now. Just go to projectchurch.com backslash groups and uh, you'll be able to sign up. So, Super excited. Let's jump in here. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Kings, the book of Book of 1 Kings, chapter number 17. 1 Kings is near the beginning of the Old Testament. And I want to talk to you about finances today. Uh, this is my favorite topic to preach on. I'm kidding. It's not. Uh, for the first couple of years of Project Church, in fact, I wouldn't even talk about it. I didn't want to be that church. I don't want to be that pastor. And then God had started to speak to me, and I recognized and realized that finances have a big impact on our lives. Did you know that finances or issues in finances is the number one cause of divorce in marriage? You know, a third of Jesus' parables, teachings, were on finances or possessions. So Jesus talked about it a lot. The Bible talks about it a lot. And we all deal with our finances a lot. And so I realized, man, if I'm going to properly lead our church and pastor our church, I need to talk about this. And this whole series has been about leveling up in your life. So we talked about leveling up in the vision for your life, the the relationships in your life, your mental, physical health in your life. And in the same way today, I want to encourage you, I want to help you to level up in your finances. How many would like to level up in your finances? Come on, somebody. Um, And and I would raise my hand right with you. And uh, I believe today is going to actually encourage us. Uh, Today was not meant to, to condemn you. Or to make you feel guilty is meant to encourage you because I believe God has a new level as it relates to how we handle and use the resources that he has given us. And so I want to read from 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to set this up real quick. Because this is a story about the prophet Elijah and uh, God speaks to him and it's in a time when there's a famine in the land. Now if you don't know what a famine is, a famine means there's no food because there's no rain. So it wasn't raining and as a result, there's no water, and without water, plants can't grow, crops can't, can't grow, and so there's a famine happening in the land, and God speaks to Elijah, and he tells him to go talk to this widow, and uh, talk to a widow during a famine, and that's where I'm going to read from today, but how many know that um, in this time, that when there's a famine in the land, it affects everyone on the ladder of economy. It doesn't matter where you are in the ladder, it affects you. Some of you remember back in 2008, when the economy took an an extreme dip, 
Uh, we had this setback happen, so to say. And in reality, that affected everyone. It affected the, the richest people in our country and the poorest people in our country. And then it began to affect the entire world. And so this is what's happening in this day. There's a famine that's affecting everyone. So I want to read from 1 Kings chapter 17. And uh, we're going to read verse 6 through 17. It says this. Um, let me switch. 1 Kings chapter 16. Here we go. 17, verse 6. says this. 7. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Pretty morbid. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. The jar of flour shall not be spent, say not spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, say not empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her whole household ate for many days, say many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Man, here's what I feel like God wants to tell you today, that some of you have found yourself in a predicament in your finances. Maybe you found yourself in a downturn, in a struggle, in a famine in your life. And I wanted to tell you that with God, there's always an exit strategy. Come on, somebody. With God, there's always an exit strategy. It doesn't matter your current situation. Your current circumstance, your current predicament, it doesn't matter how full your bank account is or how empty it is. I want to tell you, if you're in a struggle, if you're in a famine, with God, there's an exit strategy. And what looks like may be death on the horizon, God may be setting you up to do a miracle to give himself the glory and to get you into your purpose and your destiny. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. You see, I think it's all about your sequence. I think a lot of us have a strategy for our life and a strategy for our finances. The problem is that our sequence is out of order. And so the title of my message is The Sequence of Financial Strategy. I want to give you the sequence of God's financial strategy. Number one is we have to be thankful. Everybody say thankful. A lot of us focus on our lack more than we focus on what we do have. We focus on what we're missing or what's not in our life rather than what God has given us and has blessed us with. And I want to tell you, this is because of our culture. Our culture would tell you, you need to wear this, to dress like this, to have this house, to drive this car, to have this image. And if you have all those things, then you'll be happy. And so you walk around in your life saying, I'm not happy because I don't have that. I don't have that car, that house, that amount in my bank account. I don't have those kicks. I don't, you know, I don't have that swag, that drip. And then as a result, you're unhappy. We're focused on what we don't have rather than what we do have. We need to be a thankful people rather than a I don't have enough people. And so I want to be a thankful person in my life. I want to be around people who are thankful. This woman... I would say was a bit of a drama queen too, okay? We got any drama queens in the room? My wife would actually point to me and say, that's you, Caleb. (laughs) We got some men and women raising their hand. Well done. This woman, I mean, I think it's interesting that Elijah actually says there, he says, listen, I want you to to, to bake me a cake and, and make me, give me the first of the bread that you make. And she's like, you don't understand. I only have a tiny bit of oil left and a tiny bit of flour. You don't understand, this is all I have left. I was about to make it, 
me and my son were about to eat it, and then we're going to die. That's the drama queen part coming out. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you just ate, you're probably not about to die. But, but she, she was being a little dramatic about it. And this story, it portrays her fear. It portrays her uncertainty. It portrays that she's literally exaggerating that death is on her doorstep. And what I see is that there was a lack of focus on what she did have. Rather than what she didn't have. She was focused on what she didn't have. Man, this is all I have left. We're about to die. We're about to run out. Rather than, I have something. I have something left. Hebrews 13, 5 says this. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content. Did you see that? It says, be content. I'm going to say it again. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I don't know about you, but I want to be content with what I have, and I have an issue with that. I live like seven minutes from Nike Outlet, and that's a temptation in my life because I'm never content with my shoes. I always need more, and my wife's like, why do you have so many shoes? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, It's an obsession. And so I regularly make trips to Nike Outlet because I'm not content. With what I have. I, want, I don't want to love money. I want to be content with what God has given me. And yet in our culture, it's pushing on us and, and, and forcing us to have this mentality that we need more. We don't have enough. We're lacking. We're not living up to, to the standard. And I want to be a church and I want us to be a people to say, man, I'm content with what I have. I'm not saying you can't bless yourself. I can't, I'm not saying you can't treat yourself. But I am saying that we're thankful for what we do have. You know, I I like thankful people. I like being around thankful people. My wife is one of the most thankful people I know. In fact, my wife isn't a glass half full person. She's a glass overflowing person. We could be going through the worst situation ever in our life. And she's like, oh, look at what God is doing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It looks like God's abandoned us. She's like, no, he's about to show up, you know. And I'm so grateful for a wife that is thankful. A wife that shows up and and is thankful regularly because that pushes me to say, why am I focused on what I don't have when I have so much? Did you know that if you own a car, you are in the top 4% of earners in the entire world? Did you know that if you you make over $42,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of earners in the entire world? Some of you are like, I ain't make that much. I'm in college. (laughs) One day you might be there. That puts it in a perspective, doesn't it? That in this world, some of you are like, well, I'm not quite there, but you're close to there. Most of us in this room are in the top 20, 10% of earners in the entire world. Probably many of us are in the top 1%. And I want you to think about that and say, man, I have so much to be thankful for. I woke up this morning with breath in my lungs. I got something to be thankful for. I got food in my stomach. In fact, we got, we got a... Nacho bar for you on the way out to put some food in your stomach. I got something to be thankful for. We have so much that God has given us. I got clothes on my back. I'm a Kings fan. I got something to be thankful for. We're young. I, that's, I'm holding on to that. We're young. I'm repping Weber, man, the good old days. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can be thankful for the good old days when it got rigged and the Lakers took our championship because the refs helped them out. You know what I'm saying? But I'm still thankful. The sequence of God's financial strategy. Look at look. If you want healthy finances, you got to start with being thankful for what you do have. How can you have health in your finances if you're not thankful for the blessings that God has given you? Second today, the second sequence is you have to trust God's provision. Trust in him. I tend to trust in myself, and I think a lot of you are with me. Right? We we think like I got this. I can manage this. I can do this. I can earn this. I work hard. And we trust in ourselves. But I want to tell you, we got to trust in God's provision. Because it doesn't matter if you're the best worker at your job. If the cutbacks come, you may be at risk. It doesn't matter if you're the healthiest eater in this room. You could wake up tomorrow and find out you have cancer. That's why we got to trust in God's provision. We can't trust in our strength or ourselves. We trust in Him. It says in verse number 13, Elijah actually speaks to the woman, and he says to her, he says, do not fear. Do as you have said. 
you're going to make a cake, but first, make me a cake. He says, you're going to make a cake for your son, for your family, but, but first, make me a cake. Do not fear. I think it's interesting that when I read it, I, I didn't notice it at first, but then I read it again. And in verse number 12, she actually says to, to him, she says, as the Lord your God lives. She didn't say the Lord my God, the Lord our God. She said the Lord your God. And I think this is actually a little glimpse into her life where I actually wonder and I question, this woman may not know God. She may not have a relationship with God. And she actually says, she says, I only have this. I only have a little oil and I only have a little flour. Here's what I think. A lot of us are living and I only have life. Where we're constantly focused on I only have this. How can I ever get ahead in life? How can I ever have joy? How can I ever have peace? How can I ever have have love in my life? Because I only have this. God only gave me this. We're living lives just waiting for them to end with the mentality, I only have this. What I'm saying is we're living a mentality that says, I just want to survive. When God intended to put us on this earth to not just survive, but to thrive. He put us on this earth to work it and to keep it, as we talked about last week. He put us on this earth to thrive on this earth. That we wouldn't just simply have that survival mentality. We would have a thriving mentality. So I want to ask you, what do you trust in? Because when you trust in God's provision, when you trust that he's going to meet your needs, you don't get caught up in what you only have. You get caught up and start thinking, God's got it all. So if I need something, all I got to do is press into the source. You know, my son, I have two boys, but my oldest, he's seven. And he always asks me how much money I have. He's always like, Dad, Dad, how much money do you have? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like in my wallet or no, no, like in your, in your bank. He just, uh, he, he relates it to, cause they watch DuckTales. And uh, so he thinks I'm like Scrooge McDuck and I swim through the coins. You know what I'm saying? He's like, dad, how, how many coins you got? How much money you have? And I'm like, you know, your dad, your dad's got some, I got a bit. And I was like, why do you always ask me? He's like, cause I want to tell my friends. But it's interesting that my son, at the same time, he knows that anytime he needs something, he can come to me and ask me for it. He trusts me. He trusts that I'm going to feed him. He trusts that I'm going to provide for him. He trusts that I'm going to give him good gifts. He trusts that I'm going to give him even what he asks for oftentimes. Now, sometimes I have to say no, as a good father does. In the same way, our father, who's a good father, he knows when we we can't eat candy every day for breakfast because that would hurt us. And so I don't let my child do that. I tell him no. In the same way, God might tell you no sometimes, but it's not because he doesn't love you. It's because he has his best intended for you. So we got to trust in God's provision. And I'm a good father, but we have a heavenly father that is so much greater that is a better father than I could ever be. And I want to encourage you today because some of you are going through a famine in your life. And I want to tell you, you can trust in God's provision. You can trust in his faithfulness. He's a good father. And when you see good fathers on earth and you say, man, what a, that's what a father should look like. We have a father that's even greater than that. And he wants to provide for you. You can trust him even in times of famine. Even in times of trouble. Because you don't know what he's doing in your story. He's going to use that famine to set you up for a miracle as he did for this woman. You know, I... I was thinking about, the, I do a lot of premarital counseling in our church, and uh, in one of the books that I go through with the couples that we do premarital counseling with, there's something in there, and they did this research, UCLA did this research, and they found that couples who rated their marriage as happy all had one thing in common, one thing in common, and that one thing that they had in common was subjective well-being. And some of you are like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> UCLA researchers, this is lab speak, right? Subjective well-being. It's lab speak for the ability to adjust to things outside of their control. So what it, was, what it says and what I tell couples when I meet with them, I said, 
Here, here's the reality. Couples who rate their marriage as happy, they know that things are going to come that are outside of their control. How many know that in life, there's a lot of things you can't control? You can control some things, but you can't control everything. And what couples who rate their marriage as happy, they're the ones that can adjust to things outside of their control in a positive way. How does that relate to this? Here's what I believe. That we are going to go through challenges. We're going to go through struggles. We're going to go through financial hardship. We're going to go through famines in our lives. But the people who are still happy, joy-filled, peace-filled, focused, are the ones that don't trust in themselves, but they trust in the God that they serve. They say, God's got me. He's got my back. I know things may look bleak, but he won't abandon me. I know I'm in a struggle, but God won't leave me. I know I'm in a valley, but he'll bring me to the mountaintop. I'm going to trust in God's provision, not in myself. That's how we have the health and the peace that I know so many are looking for in your finances. So number two, the second sequence, we got to be thankful, then we got to trust God's provision. And third and finally, we have to give to God. Some of you are like, oh my goodness, I knew it was coming. Here he goes. He's going to tell us to give to the church. If you're a first time guest here, I'm so sorry. You came your first week and the pastor's talking about money. He's talking about giving. But here's what I believe. I wanted today to encourage you. I believe that today was meant to encourage you and strengthen you and strengthen your finances. Not to condemn you or to guilt trip you. Give to God. Here's what it says actually in this passage. Elijah says to the woman, he says, based on what you have, I'm going to ask you to give some of your cake to me. I'm going to ask you to give some of that to me. You see, this isn't about what God wants from you. It's about what God wants for you. A lot of us get caught up in this mentality like, like oh, I know the Bible talks about giving and giving to God. and God just wants stuff from me. God doesn't need it. He doesn't need your money. It's about what he wants for you. It's about what he wants for your life. He wants you to be a generous person. He wants you to look outside of yourself and your own needs and to the interests and needs of others. He wants you to be about something bigger than yourself. That's why we get to the church. Not because the church needs our money, but because God has called us to be a part of, pro pro of taking the gospel and, and projecting the gospel all around this city, this nation, this world. And we can do that through the local church. It's a powerful, powerful way. We give to God. So I want to invite some friends up here with me. I know some of you have been like, what's going to happen? My friends are going to come help me. They're going to join me up here today. And uh, I actually have a pie. How many love pumpkin pie? Any pumpkin pie? Fan? I got a pumpkin pie right here and a serving spoon. And uh, so, so I wanted to portray this and, and show this with this image, this illustration of a pie. Because God has given us something to manage. The Bible talks about stewardship, about stewarding or, or taking care of and using what God has given you in a wise way. And so we all have our pieces of the pie that we have to divvy out. You guys know that, right, in your life? So first we start out and our first piece of the pie is the house payment. How many make your house payment every week, or every month, I should say? And this is a big old piece. So I, know, I don't know how hungry you are, but you're getting a big old piece today, all right? So that house payment, oh my goodness, you're welcome. That's a big old piece. And uh, whether you rent, whether you're a student, whether you own a house, you all got to make a payment on where you live. Maybe you rent a room, maybe you rent an apartment, maybe you rent a condo, maybe you rent a house, maybe you bought, you've bought a house. Either way, we all make this payment. And that's a big chunk. So most of us are like, okay, first payment, house. I got to make sure I do that because I got to have a place to live. Then the second piece of the pie that we usually have is, is that car payment. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Thank you, Jesus that uh, I actually have paid off one of our cars. And uh, I got the other one we're still working on. And so there's that piece of the pie, the car payment. And uh, some of you, your car payments are a little bigger than they should have been. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but you were trying to treat yourself. So you got that piece of the pie. And you're, you're paying the car payment. You're paying the car, car payment. Next up, this one hurts me. It makes me sad. 
the credit cards. And some of you have uh, been caught up in credit cards for a long time. You've been caught up in credit card debt. When I married my wife, I actually told her, I don't want to carry credit card debt. Why would I do that and pay 22%, 25%, 20%, 15% every month to someone giving money to, to people that don't need it? Um, and, and it's actually hindering and hurting my life. And so Chrissy and I have never carried any credit card debt. We still use credit cards, but we pay them off every month, so we're not getting hit with all that interest. And I know some of you are bound up in credit card debt. I want to encourage you, 2019, you need to make it a goal. You begin to bring that down. You begin to knock out. Some of you need to cut up some of them credit cards because you've been buying things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. You know what I'm saying? And so credit cards are, are a big chunk of a lot of our pie. And some of you are sweating out there right now because you know I'm talking about you. Next up. We got, oh, that education. Got to pay Sally Mae back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so Sally Mae gets hers. When I married my wife, um, we actually had some, some student loans and a good amount of student loans. And uh, so we started paying those off. And it's been, we've been married for 10 years, and we are still paying them off. But let me tell you, we are 18 months away from having our student loans knocked out. Come on, somebody. So how many of you, some of you want financial freedom and financial health. It doesn't come overnight. It doesn't happen in a day. It doesn't happen after one sermon. It happens by consistently being faithful and doing what you need to do. And so we've been cutting that down, the education. I got you, don't worry. Monica, I'm coming. And so, so we've cut that out one, a year and a half away. It's taken time, it's taken diligence but we've done it. And then this one may be the worst of them all for a lot of you because you got to do this. Taxes. And uh, I'm sorry, Monica, but you're going to get a big old piece. You know what I'm saying? Because some of you experience this. The, the taxes get you, don't they? Taxes get you. And so, you know, we got to pay to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I'd encourage you all to, to pay your taxes. I don't want any of you getting arrested here on a Sunday morning. But, uh, you know, we have to do that. This is a piece of pie. So you know what that leaves? That leaves, I got one piece left. And uh, this is actually my favorite piece because I'm going to serve this to myself. I'm talking about me. You know, I love me some me. <laughs> I love me. And so, you know, I start eating that. Mm, I probably, you know, I... Nike Outlet is calling. <laughs> I got to get over there, get me some new kicks. You know, got to hit, oh, Apple, uh-huh. Love me a new iPhone, too. <laughs> and so we start taking care of me. Got my clothes. Got to go to the movies. I like eating out. Who likes eating out? Ooh, when I go out, I go out. You know what I'm saying? I go all in. Took my wife to Perry Gary's the other night. That was for me. <laughs> oh, but I was actually thinking about it. Hold up, hold up a second. I got that tax refund. That rebate came. Oh, hey. Oh, okay. Give me some of that back. Come on, somebody. That's me. That's all me. Mm-hmm. So here's what happens. I have a friend. And this friend... He can never finish any meal. He always leaves one or two bites at the end. And I asked him one time, like, dude, why do you always leave like two bites or one bite? And he said, I, I do that because I feel guilty. I feel guilty if I eat the whole thing and it makes me feel better if I leave like one or two bites left. So here's what I've seen. What a lot of us do is then we remember, oh, what about God? What about God? And so, like, that's right. And the bucket might come by or God might put something on our heart. And we're like, well, I feel guilty, so I guess I'll give him those two leftover little bites that I'm not going to finish anyways. I'll give him that. Or some of us, it's just the crumbs that are left. And we're just scraping the crumbs 
into the plate for God. But here's what I wanted to tell you. God, he deserves to be at the head of our table. God should be at the head of our table. When it comes to our life, when it comes to our family, when it comes to our jobs, and when it comes to our finances. God should be at the head. We should reserve the best seat for him. The first piece of the pie. And I know some of you have never given to God. You've never given to the church. I'm not here to make you feel guilty, but here's what I am here to tell you. This is the only thing, the only place in Scripture where God says, test me. He says, test me in this. And watch that I will not fill up your storehouses to overflowing. You can trust me. You know that actual uh, research shows that people who designate a piece of their pie for God a percentage of their pie for God, they're better managers of their money. You know why? Because they're intentional. Because they go, this much goes to God, that means I got a plan for the rest. You know what I mean? And so some of you here today, you've never given, I want to challenge you. I'm not telling you a percentage. You know, my wife and I, we started with 10% when we got married. We said, I know it talks about the tithe in the Bible, and I'm going to do that. But over the years, we've actually increased that. Our goal is every year to increase the amount we're giving back to God. And someday I hope to live on less than I give to God. One day, that's my goal. I don't know if I'll get there, but that's a goal. So I want to challenge you. Maybe you've never given anything to God. He gets the crumbs. He gets the leftovers. The bucket passes you by and you're like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I got like two bucks. That'll make me feel better. This is my leftovers. I want to challenge you that you would say, you know what? I'm going to start giving this much to God. I'm going to, I'm going to be intentional about it. I'm going to set out a piece of my pie for my Savior. Because you want to know the best part about it all? You want to know the best part about it all? Is that God, our God, He owns the whole bakery. He owns the whole bakery. You hear me, church? He owns the whole bakery. And some of you are worried, if I give back to God, I'm not going to have enough. He owns it all. He is the ultimate resource. In fact, he owns it all so much. I wanted to illustrate this for somebody here today. We're going to give out some pies. Who needs a pie in this place? Who needs a pie? I got you. We got a pumpkin pie. I got you. Listen here. Raycel, you look hungry. There you go. Wait, wait, what's this one? Dutch apple pie. Oh, my goodness. There's somebody in this room that's going through some financial famine in their life right now. And this is supposed to be an illustration for you that God owns it all. Right now, raise your hand. You need this prophetically over your life. Here you go. Can you pass this down for me? I like your jersey. Go Raiders. Okay. Listen, we got we got more pies. Who, who wants a pie? Come on. Pass this down that row. If you want a pie, here we go. We got to go to the other side too. Hold up, hold up, hold up. We're running now. God owns it all. He owns it all, sir. He owns the bakery. He's got all the pies. You need a pie, God's got you. Some of you are happy. You got something to bring to the Super Bowl party now. Come on now. I got two left. I got two left. Okay, we got here. You guys look excited. I, you can eat this whole thing yourself, Jared. Get it. It's his first time. Jared got a pie. I want to tell you, church, listen, God owns the bakery. He has more than enough, and all he's asking for us is that we would trust him. We would trust Him with what He's given us. We would be thankful for the blessings that we had. We would give back to Him. I want to challenge you. Would you give God the head seat at your table? Give God the head seat at your table and watch what He will do. Your life will be so much more fulfilled, so much more purpose-focused, so much more life-giving, so much more peace-filled, so much more joy-covered. I want to tell you, you give Jesus the head seat at your table and everything changes. Give him the head seat. Today, I believe there's somebody in this room that needs to make Jesus the head of their life. It's not just about your finances, it's about your life. You've been running from God. You've maybe turned your back on God. Maybe you've never known God, but today, this this has spoken to you and the Spirit is speaking to your life right now and Jesus is saying, let me in. Make me the head and watch what I'll do. Make me the head of your life and watch how I'll move. Make me the head of your family and watch what I'll, what I'll do in your life. Today, someone in this room needs to make Jesus and give him the head seat of your life once again. Would you bow your heads with me across this place?